Good Monday afternoon. Welcome to the I Love Seville show. My name is Jerry Miller. It's good to be with you. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. I'm wearing a Claiborne Education t-shirt. My pal, my homie, my chum, my amigo, my compadre, um, just a good guy. Lee Elberson, the chief executive officer and co-owner of Claiborne Education, went on the show last week, and I promised him if he sent us a care package, I'd wear his shirt. Lee, I'm a man of my word. Claiborne Education, a trusted, trusted resource, trusted resource um, in education of any capacity, Claiborne Education. And send me your shirts. Send me your t-shirts. I'll wear them on air and I'll give your, I'll give your business some, uh, some, some plug. Good show lined up for you. Eric Kelly is going to join us in 17 minutes. Eric Kelly in 17 minutes. Completely, when, when some businesses have pivoted their models in restaurants from dine-in to doing takeout and curbside, that's a pivot. Eric Kelly has flat out reinvented himself. Again. Again. As a businessman. Great renaissance man. He's a coffee guy, launched a coffee company, is a wedding photographer of the superstars, and now is uh, an entrepreneur in the green space, um, making home, I'll let him tell you, home garden boxes, boxes of, of cedar to house and home your garden in a strategic and convenient capacity. Um, this show brought to you by Interstate Pest and Service Companies and Scott Wagner, Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Interstate is a home's best friend, four generations of family behind it. Now is a good time to get your home serviced, um, pest control, anything of that capacity. Interstate, four generations of family. They live in the community. They, they see you around. That's what's great about working with a local business, and they're really COVID-19 mindful um, and health conscious. Interstate Pest and Service Companies, just like Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine, changing people's lives through sports medicine and physical therapy. Before we get to headlines, before we get to headlines, and we're about to, Judah, um, I encourage everyone watching this program to give it a like, give it a share. Just give it a like, give it a share. The only thing I ask of you is to punch the like button or share it to your news feed. It's even better. We work hard on the show. Um, let's get to the Thomas Jefferson Health District um, data dashboard. Judah, uh, put that on screen, my friend. What do we uh, make of it? Um, I'm, I, I put the dashboard up every single day. Why I put the dashboard up every single day is it's important for you to understand the numbers. And this is something that anyone is talking about, um, depth and robust or statistics or impact. Here's your go-to resource, the ones the city councilors are posting on their social media and Facebook pages. Check them out. They do a fabulous job of updating the dashboard at 10 a.m., um, I think it's daily. It's certainly Monday through Friday. Yeah, 10 a.m. daily. 319 total cases, 60 hospitalizations, 13 fatalities. Um, one of the statistics, one of our viewers, Matt Daring, Matt Daring, um, asked me to highlight or asked us to pay attention to is the percentage of hospitalizations. Um, he's a very numbers-oriented guy, and I think it's a good metric to consider. 319 total cases. 60 hospitalizations. Um, follow that. Um, I think you really want to watch the percentage um, there. Uh, don't focus on fatalities, which is something that I've been, you know, made the mistake of doing. Um, let's go to the bottom of the graphic, Judah. Hospitalizations by age. Um, the trend continues. We see the trend. Our older population, obviously, the most vulnerable. Pre-existing conditions, obviously the most vulnerable. Follow the dashboard. We'll allocate a little portion of the program to the dashboard every single day. We'll compare and contrast it um, to previous dashboards on the show. Due to the next headline I want to get to is an important one, I think. And this headline is something I'd like to get on screen. Eric Kelly's about 13 minutes away. Give me a thumbs up. Uh, and this one's from Denmark. The coronavirus has not accelerated since reopening the economy in mid-April. This is, I mean, I think it's something to talk about. Uh, Denmark was one of the first countries outside of Asia to ease its economic restrictions. Repeat, worth repeating, Denmark, the first country, first, outside of Asia to ease its coronavirus lockdown. 
It has not seen accelerated um, spread of COVID-19 since the loosening of the restrictions began in April. So we have a very small sample size. We have 15 days, and that's the, the, first, the first cautious response anyone's going to say to this headline from the New York Times. This is syndicated from routers, but it originated at the New York Times, um, is we need a larger sample size than 15 days. That's fair. I'm just giving you an update of the first country outside of Asia to open up its economy and loosen restrictions, and so far, not an accelerated spread of the virus. We'll watch Denmark, we'll watch Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, Florida, and a number of other states very closely. The next headline, Goldman Sachs. I want to speed through these before we get to local headlines, but this one's an important one. Goldman Sachs... And Goldman Sachs is a titan in finance, a, a, a titan in finance. They say the economy has probably bottomed now ahead of what can be a second half surge. Now, I'm going to show you the Charlottesville area, not now, the Charlottesville Area Association of Realtors Q1 report. And I'm going to show you Jim Duncan's analysis of what could happen. Jim Duncan, a realtor with Nest Realty in the Charlottesville and Central Virginia market, shortly. Before I do the Goldman Sachs headline one more time on screen, probably bottom now, potentially ahead of a second half surge. A lot of agents you're hearing are saying potentially a second half surge. A lot of the street is saying, look, the street just had its best year, it, it, its best month in, depending on the, the, the index, it, its best month in, 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 in decades. The Dow, NASDAQ, uh, New York Stock, I'm, I'm serious. The street is crushing it right now, okay? April was fuego. Goldman Sachs says we may be on the bottom here. Denmark is saying we opened up and loosened restrictions in mid-April, 15, 16 days ago. We haven't seen a spread of the virus in our country. And Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, um, Tennessee, the ones around us, too early to call. Benchmarks I'm throwing to you to consider. Benchmarks I'm throwing to you to consider. The next headline is a local one, and it's a miss, um, it's a tricky headline. It's a tricky headline. And why this is a tricky headline um, is because it's Q1. Now, the Charlottesville Area Association of Realtors releases a quarterly report, basically a snapshot on the condition of the market over the last 90 days. The Q1 report just came out, and the Q1 report data is, is great. It's great, but it's not an indication right now of what's happening because COVID-19 hit Charlottesville and Central Virginia mid-March. So as this Q1 report was being finalized, all these deals that were under contract that were pending that had 15, 20, 30, 45 days to close hadn't closed yet. So they were closing on the back end of Q1. A good example is I bought a home, sold my home in Redfields, moved to the east side of town, and we closed on March 27th. So the closing of our home falls in Q1. Really a good indication of what COVID-19 has done to the association, done to the uh, Central Virginia market, is going to be Q2, better yet, Q3. Because you have that lag of 30, 45, 60 days to get the closing before it's officially registered. So you watch the data, Q2, Q3. This headline, not a true indication of what's really out there, but it's a headline that's out in the marketplace. Still, it makes you nostalgic of early March in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Early March in the country, the economy was crushing it. You had February reach, the stock market reached an all-time high. February, the stock market is at an all-time high. The housing market for Q1, I'm looking at the data, absolutely phenomenal. And it shows you the incredible impact of a historic Never seen before pandemic and what it can do to any economy. Okay? Literally screeching halt. The data shows it. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Jim Duncan, four things that could happen to the Charlottesville real, real estate market. This is an intriguing one to me. He is a phenomenal agent, I think an associate broker with Nest Realty, really does a tremendous job, really has done a good job in the Crozet market, does a good job with his blog, Real Central Virginia. Someone tell Jim Duncan I'm giving him some props on the program. 
Someone tag him or text Jim Duncan now, please. He's probably on a bicycle riding around Crozet right now. But the first quarter 2020 market report, four things that could happen in the Charlottesville market. I follow him on Twitter. He's great. He says, one of the four things that could happen is this. Well, guys, Jim Duncan says, the spring 2020 Charlottesville real estate market could be paused for now, and it could resume in the fall. We'll pick up much of the lost traction volume in the fall. First thing that could happen. That's the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario would be the spring market that never happened, reinvents itself, rebirths itself, recreates itself, comes from the ashes, and, and, and shows this like shining light on Central Virginia, and the spring market comes in the fall. Ideal scenario. The second scenario he proposes is the second best. We're not going to have a spring market in 2020. The spring market will be spring 2021. That's not terrible either, right? I would take that as well. I think we would all take that. Now, the next scenario is troubling. We could see a wave of foreclosures and short sales created by unprecedented employment. Over 30 million Americans unemployed, over 500,000 Virginians unemployed, 30,000 jobs projected to be lost in Charlottesville and Central Virginia alone due to COVID-19. And we have a new jobless report coming out this week. That's the third option. And the fourth one, something completely different. We didn't see COVID-19 coming, and we might not see the next thing either. How can you even argue with that? You're right. We didn't see COVID-19 coming. What the heck is coming down the pipe? Not to be a pessimist. But those are the four things, and I think there's four great predictions. I would love to see the spring market rebirth itself in the fall. I would love to. I would love to. And I think for that to happen, for the spring market to rebirth itself, I'm going to straight up say it. I think for the spring market to rebirth itself in the fall, the University of Virginia is going to have to have its students on grounds again. That will be a jolt to the economy. And why it will be a jolt to the economy, whether you want to hear this or not, 20, 25,000 students with their mommy and daddy's credit cards, with a mindset of them being superheroes from a sickness and health standpoint, they don't give a, you know what? They'll go out and spend their daddy's credit card. They're, they feel like they're 18 to 22. When you were 18 to 22, you felt like you were invincible. I felt like I was invincible. They'll go out, they'll take the credit card, they'll spend money, it'll be a jolt to the Charlottesville economy. That's one of the key indicators for the, the spring market opening up, happening in the fall. If they don't come to grounds, you're going to see a delay and rebound for real estate. You have a lot of great indicators there, and the indicators that you have are, unem well, unemployment was low. Um, interest rates um, are obscenely low. Cheap money, cheap money. Buy a home now. Listen to me. Buy a home now and save 10 to 15%. Justin Goodman is watching the program. Scott, Scott Goodman's uh, uh, fabulous offspring. I love Justin Goodman on this show. Justin Goodman has come on this program, and he spread some serious knowledge on the show. He said, I just went out to breakfast in Florida. We'll see how it goes down there. He's watching in Florida. Justin, thank you for offering that perspective. Charles from Orzo, welcome to the program. Patty Zeller, Animal Connection owner, businesswoman, welcome to the program. The attorney, Elliot Harding, welcome to the show. Keith Smith, um, welcome to the program. The star of Real Talk. Next headline. Next headline. Uh, Blue Wheel Bicycles, intriguing headline, but it makes sense. NBC29, you got that on screen for us, J-Dubs? NBC 29 does a nice little piece, a positive piece. All the media outlets watching the show do a positive piece, do positive pieces. You can, you can cover stories about COVID-19, but they do not have to be doom and gloom. They can be positive. That's what separates the I Love Seville show from the news. We highlight positive news. NBC 29 does a nice little piece about Blue Wheel Bicycles having an uptick in sales despite the pandemic. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It makes perfect sense. I can't be cramped up in this house anymore. I got to figure out to maintain sanity with our kids and get, do something outside. I got to keep them preoccupied. Spend a couple of hundred bones, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred. Maybe you're getting a family of bikes and buy some bicycles and get outside and bike. 
That's a positive that has come from this. I like it. That's a good little business over there in the X Art Park. That's a thriving little piece of property. UVA head coaches, you get the head coaches headline up there? Kudos, another positive headline from the I Love Seville show. UVA head coaches, assistant coaches, and its athletic directors voluntarily taking a 5 to 10% pay cut. Can you expect anything else from Tony Bennett, from Brian O'Connor? Would you expect anything else from a George Galnavach or from Bronco? Volu now, you're going to say they make bank. Still, voluntarily, here, keep some of my money. You get that headline on screen for them, Judah? Thank you, sir. That was a good one. Um... Two more things before we get to Eric Kelly. I'm going to close the program with a fabulous message from Jim Ryan, UVA President Jim Ryan, on the I Love Seville show about 120 or so. Fabulous message that you don't want to miss. Um, I'm going to tell you about a bar crawl my family and I did that was super safe, COVID-19 friendly and supports the businesses in the community. And I'm going to tell you one of the next things I'm really going to highlight and focus on this program. I love Seville first. I love Seville show first. Okay. How are you going to get, ladies and gentlemen, and tap the like button when you hear this idea. How are we going to get people back to dining and shopping districts when people are trepid and concerned about their safety. Let's take the downtown mall. People are going to be concerned, as they should, about dining in a small dining room like Petit Pois Restaurant or a small dining room like, I mean, there's so many of them. You know what I'm talking about. Tavola has a small dining room. How are people going to come back? How we have to do it is by easing consumer consumption and bringing it slowly back into the community. Slow push into shopping. Slow push into dining. So here's the idea. And I'm going to do a strong analysis on I Love Seville about this. I think the city of Charlottesville, and I'm going to tag Mayor Walker on this. I'm going to tag Lloyd Snook. I'm going to tag Heather Hill. I'm going to tag Cena McGill, and I'm going to tag Michael Payne. I'm going to tag Brian Wheeler. We should take the downtown mall and turn it into a beer garden. And this beer garden should be controlled like this. There should be a hut in the center of the mall that's employed by an hourly employee. And that hourly employee will make a living wage. Yes, Michael Payne, they will make a living wage. And at this hut in the center of the downtown mall, you can go and purchase an armband. And that armband is going to cost $2 for the armband at the hut from the center of the downtown mall. And along with that $2 armband that you get, you're going to get a cup. And that cup's going to be from Charlottesville. And that $2 is going to go to Charlottesville, the city coffers. And then you're going to get this cup and you're going to be able to take this one specific cup to the restaurants on the downtown mall, and you're going to get beer or wine or cocktails in this cup. And you're going to be able to take this cup with your red armband and walk outside on the downtown mall from the pavilion to the Omni, from restaurant to restaurant with this cup. And that's going to help people come back to Charlottesville and it's downtown mall because they're going to be outside eating and drinking as opposed to tied to a dining room. Now think about what's going to happen here. This is going to get upfront revenue for the city of Charlottesville because the $2 armband. It's got to be a marginal cost. It can't be super expensive. It can't be a barrier of entry. Make it 2 bucks. City of Charlottesville keeps that 2 bucks revenue. The city of Charlottesville also gets the back-end revenue that comes from cocktails, beer, and wine, and restaurants selling more of its food. When you sell more of the food, there's a thing called the meals tax on the bill where the money goes to the city of Charlottesville. So guys, Charlottesville, Virginia wins twice. Charlottesville wins on the front end by selling the red banner, the red 
thing around the wrist, the bracelet, whatever the hell it's called. And Charlottesville wins on the back end by selling more food and drinks at its restaurants so the meals tax get up. Even more importantly, the restaurants win because people are afraid to go to them, but you're going to be less afraid to go if you have a beverage and a snack and a sandwich to go walking up and down the mall. So yes, restaurateurs may have to pivot their model a little bit and have more hand-friendly food, but the cup is no problem. I'm going to do an analysis of that on I Love Steve. I'm going to talk more about that after um, Eric Kelly. I got a lot of people weighing in on this concept. Andre Xavier says, I love the idea. I know, it's a great one. Thank you for watching the show. Um, he says, remember when we talked about the CACVB to be located on the hunt on the center of the mall? We did, and they ignored us. This is an even more dynamic concept. And, and, and restaurateurs that are watching the program, Tag all the restaurant owners and tell them to watch what I just said. You may have to sacrifice this. Restaurant tours, you may have to sacrifice this. The cut through road on 4th Street. You may have to sacrifice that, Charlottesville Albemarle, uh, Charlottesville Downtown Business Owners Association. It's going to be difficult to make a pitch from Pavilion to Omni of Beer Garden with a cup provided the city and a red bracelet that they give you, you know, the ones that you've seen from keg parties and a cup they give you and you being able to go from the whiskey jar or the livery stable all the way to Commonwealth Sky Bar when there's a road that's cutting through the beer garden. And the road has a long history that I'm not even going to get into now. So that road and my proposal, and you're going to be pissed off at me, but in the end you're going to realize that I have your best interest at heart. The road and my proposal and the proposal I'm going to say is going to be a bone, it's a negotiation tactic, that I'm going to throw to the other side who's going to be opposed to this, and I'm going to say, close the road, make it a beer garden from the pavilion to the Omni, and drive taxable revenue and support the small businesses and restaurants in the downtown mall, because right now it's a ghost town. More about this after Eric Kelly. Jude, I'm going to try to Skype Eric Kelly. Um, are you ready for that? You are? Okay. It's ringing right now. I'm going to ask Eric Kelly about this. I'm going to do a really thorough analysis that I'm going to write up really nice and clean. Then I'm going to tag all the city councilors and all of City Hall. And then I'm going to make this go viral. Um, Eric Kelly. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. How's your weekend? What's new? We had your weekend. wife. What's the, the, weekend the, the, the Kellys. Okay, I'm going to make a suggestion. You ready for this? Yes, make it. The Kellys. You and your wonderful wife have made the yep. I Love Seville show exceptionally better over the last week, and you're going to hit a home run now. Awesome. I think the Kellys, Laura and Eric, and you have three children? Yes. We should we have, like, meet the Kellys, follow the Kellys, some kind of live streaming show like I'm doing here about you and your family. Is that called reality TV? I mean, you would be making it. People would love it. <laughs> I mean, I've been thoroughly engaged with your content that you've been creating. It's so different, but it's so compelling. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, you know, today is day 51 of our quarantine social isolation thing that we're doing. And we've, we've been documenting it the whole time uh, with these new cameras that were loaned to me by Fujifilm. And... We've put it online every day. 50 blog posts, 50 sets of photos every day. And we have just been trying to make every day count and do whatever we can to make things work. Well, I think you have. We, I mean, you know, in some areas, the, yes, how about, we have. How about this question for you? How you, I, and I'm a huge fan of you, and I can follow you around all week long saying very nice things about you. Um, I'm happy yeah. to, you ha you're a visionary, you like me see opportunity and ideas everywhere. It's our biggest strength, it's also our biggest weakness. Um, you have made a coffee empire, you have done a photography empire, now you're doing a, go how, what do you characterize this, um, this empire under what umbrella name? I don't know. Is it, is it, gar is it home, what is it, home decor? Uh, gardening, okay. gardening, yes. Um, you know, last year I spent, uh, is my volume okay? Am I good? Yeah, you're good. Like Judy's good. Okay. Yeah, he's yeah? good. Yeah. Good? Okay. So last year I spent um, about a week and a half 
traveling around Houston and doing work in Chicago with uh, Nicole Burke from Gardenary Co. And the book that she just wrote that I photographed f for um, is dropping tomorrow. Um, and so we have, you know, for the last couple of years, been a part of this gardening world, trying to get our foot wet and trying to understand a little bit about it. And so since weddings aren't happening currently, well, they are sometimes some places, I don't know. Uh, well, Adam, I mean, Adam, Adam told us there's like some super DL weddings on like private properties that can happen. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of my weddings, um, I just found out today that, uh, June 27th in Turkey, Turkey is still happening. So I've got to figure out if I'm going to Turkey or not. But everything else between now and or between the middle of March and the middle of August has moved to either later this year or next year. And so I was just faced with a lot of time to contemplate what's going on and how do I make a living when I'm not making a living doing what I've done. So I built a box for my mother-in-law and a garden box and I posted a photo while I was building the box on Facebook and somebody was like, Ooh, can I have one? Can I have one? Can I have one? Like all these people just decided I want to get into gardening also because everybody's home and we live in, you know, more of an urban setting. So people don't have a ton of room. And so it's pretty easy to start with 12 to 16 square feet of space to garden in. And so I've sold about 45 boxes. I'm building number 37 and 38 right now. Actually, I've sold about 50 boxes. So I just hardcore pivoted real quick into building these cedar boxes. So you sold, you sold 50 boxes in 30 days? Yeah. Dude. All right. I'm not going to blow up your spot right now. All right. I don't want to blow up your spot, but I want to give you props at the same time here. So you just completely pivoted started yeah. this from scratch and in the first 30 days 13k in gross give or take <sighs> come on do you ever well, do you ever look at do you ever look at yourself in the mirror and be like that's what i'm talking about dog laura what's up dog that's right um yeah you know that's not have, bad right i have the no it's not bad at all yeah I'm ba I was baffled by it i've been baffled by it you have no yeah. you have no team members now you do have cost of goods obviously right i I did. We were fortunate enough to have the funding from the PPP come through. Oh, nice. For my photography business. And so that's allowed me to bring my uh, employee on um, back, the one that was working on my photography stuff with me back in. Um, and he's doing photography, splitting his time between photography and, and then also helping me build boxes and install boxes and dirt and all that stuff. So, yes, about 13K in boxes. There's one other thing that we decided to do. Ooh. I wanted to get some herbs. Yeah. Some not, not, not medicinal sure. herbs. From like Harrisonburg, plants. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so I, I was at a, a little farm stand on Garth Road, and I asked the people. Shady Lane Farms uh, have a little, little stand there uh, a couple days a week, and I asked him if I could buy these herbs from them wholesale. And he's like, no, we actually buy them wholesale from – Blue Jay Farms out in Harrisonburg. So he gave me his number and I called him and he said, yeah, absolutely. I can have some tomorrow for you. And I said, like, do you need anything from me? He's like, nope, just meet you on the side of the road. And so I picked up uh, 150 plants and they were sold in four days. That's awesome. And we've now sold over 1,200 plants off our side porch. I prop the door open and people come in and they take one one to 92 no somebody the most i've sold is 32 plants so 96 dollars. somebody bought a whole flat of lavender that's amazing and um i've sold over 1200 plants off my side porch through all through either cash sanitized cash or venmo here's the hardest question for you yes what happens when wedding photog photography can happen again Yes, that is a question. Have you and have you have you thought you've thought that obviously? Oh, absolutely. Because so, would you just give this up? So I think there's something that I've been learning and trying to work on understanding how to scale businesses or how to start businesses that don't require me. Yeah, this thing won't require me if it does need to keep going, or um, you know, it's going to have busy season. It's going to have spring spring box season and fall box season. So really, it's like. 
March, April, May, what, September, October, November, maybe? Yeah. yeah. So maybe a couple of months off in the middle. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But um, I think the biggest question that we're trying to answer is when weddings begin again, I have the ones that I'm contracted for and I'm going to continue booking some, but how much of what old life looked like do we want to go back to? This normal is becoming normal. Yeah. Like it's just becoming something new. Our life is changing in, in such a way that this feels really good. Um, and so I think the biggest question is how similar do we want life to look like to what it was? And so I don't think that something like this would end when weddings begin again. Uh, and how much wedding work do I need to do to maintain more home presence and less travel? And, you know, what's that daily number of income that the family needs sure. for, for me to and for Laura to provide to function at a, you know, an 80% or 90% home rate rather than... 40% or 50% home rate. Does that make that sense? That makes perfect sense. So I think we don't have to answer those questions fully right now because I know I don't have a wedding for another almost two months. And then, uh, then, then we look at what the rest of the summer looks like and what the, what the fall looks like. So I'm just really taking it a day at a time trying to understand what, what goes on next. Herbs aren't going to sell forever. Right, 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 right. I might be done this week. I, might, I, I said I was going to not order any more herbs after – this last Saturday delivery. Yeah, but dude, you were already thinking about ways where you can create like some kind of brand extension or supplemental rev stream with this like, and do you have a brand moniker for this new endeavor? Have you thought about a moniker? Yeah, we're trying to figure out if we want to franchise off of what um, Nicole Burke started, Gardenary Co., Rooted Garden, her company that she started out of Houston. If we want to work on a franchise with her or if we want to start something completely different. So co completely different. We don't know. Okay. All right. Well, Claire Francis is watching. She says, I'm coming over to buy some plants. I got to order more. I have some stuff left. All right. Get but some orders in, guys. If you guys have any orders, get them in. Keith Smith is loving what he's hearing from you. Ray Cadell, Andre Xavier, Justin Goodman, Todd Proctor. Hello. Joshua Tracy, Neil Sam, Laura. Laura says we have a bromance. I, we, we may, Laura. April Marshall, John Craig. Hello. Hello. Um, put some messages in here, and I'll relay it to Eric. What, is re yeah. what do restaurants look like? What, what do restaurants look like? Yeah. I mean, When we're out of here. What's it going to look like, Eric? Uh, that's a question that I have not contemplated because I've been so inundated with all this other stuff that I need to do. You know, I would love to see uh, restaurants growing more of their own stuff so that they don't have to ship as much stuff and rely on so many people in the supply chain, growing their own stuff locally and, and, and just adjusting so that we don't rely so on so big of a, a footprint. Uh -huh. uh, and then it, in terms of how do they serve people and, have an inside space. You know, I think people are, I think people are going to have to just think more. Um, they're going to have to think more before they go out. Like I I've talked about events with some people and they're like, we're going to, we're going to start taking temperature check at these events. And so, you know, I think that us being more, us, the consumer being more um, careful about, how we interact with the world when we're not feeling well or, you know, I don't know. I think that it's a lot on us. I don't know how different the restaurants can be. What do you, you know, put tables further away. Maybe that cuts down on the number of heads you can have that makes the meals go up in price. Um, I don't think that can work. I don't think that don't model think that, can I work. I think that totally, that totally changes the vibe of a restaurant. Yeah. And I don't, think that, and it only what, makes it for rich people. Right. Which sucks. You know what I think would be nice? We talked about this the other day. Restaurants are charging full price for things and also asking for tips, which is totally fine and great. But um, what can the city do to promote restaurants staying open right now when, they, when they're struggling? So what if we took meals tax away for the next little while? What if the city didn't get their 
cut of the meal or are they going to ask the restaurants to lower their prices? The meals tax is on pause to the city's credit. They're still going oh, to, yeah, they're still going to try to collect the money. It's on pause. So I hope these restaurants are managing their cash flow accordingly because the city still wants their loot. It's just going to be at a larger lump sum down the road. Um, yeah. So when, how are they going to have it? I don't know. That's, that's what's going to like, if you're, here's another thing that I'm hearing. I'm seeing some of the, uh, some of the restaurants, and I'm not saying in Charlottesville. I'm just talking in general terms here. I'm seeing some of um, the restaurants and small businesses take the PPP money they got and not allocate it to rehiring employees. That's totally fine. It just turns into a two-year 1% loan. Exactly, right? exactly. So they're repivoting and changing their model completely. Um, and using that money instead of bring back employees to change the model. And the model that's coming back in a lot of regards is just this stripped down leaner model um, with less like fat on the payroll. Yeah, I think that we're going to find a lot of leaner models. You know, I was thinking about what restaurants look like. I was standing in Milan masked on, you know, employee with his mask. They've got three little tables right inside the door. I, we got Milan last night for dinner. Yeah. And I'm like, they have all this space. Right. And so I think we're going to have to reimagine the space that people are in. And I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, I hate to see what happens to commercial real estate after this. Yeah, you said that to and, me. Yeah. And so like, what, what is a, a restaurant going from full size to a third of the size with more, more window up carry out like you were at Public Oyster yesterday? Yeah. Got a window. Yeah. So the, the open air market, like I've heard is happening in dairy, the dairy building. When it opens, like, it got delayed. Maybe, maybe more kiosks like that are going to happen and, uh, and, and people are required to wait outside until they can come in. I, maybe we're going to have more kind of market type things. Yeah. Rather than all these sit down standalone restaurants. I have no idea. Uh, no, I think you're hundred percent right, dude. I think you're hundred percent right. What did you think of the idea as you were waiting to come on? I went a little long cause I got excited and I apologize. What did you think of the idea of converting the downtown mall from the pavilion to the Omni to this like open air? And I, we got to come up with a good brand moniker to p position this. Is the term beer garden applicable here? Is that the right I, term? You know, can someone let us know what it's called from Pavilion to the Omni, having just an area where people can drink only on the mall? Yeah, I mean, is that a 24-hour, is that all the time? I mean, I think that... The well, it would be restaurant-specific, so it would, like, it would stop when the restaurants close. Or last call, last call. Yeah, I mean, I think you just need to have a barrier of how to get in and out of the space. I mean, you talked about 4th Street as a through way and down by the other thing as a through way, I feel like you would almost have to make those through things at the end of the mall, kind of like a track. Yeah. And inside that track is kind of fair game for whatever going from place to place. Maybe that's a, a, a way to do it, but you have to have some kind of travel transit from the other side, from one side to the other. Yeah. I don't know. How do you feel in, uh, you and I have a lot of similarities here. Small business owners, got kids, fan, you know, how, how are you feeling about future Charlottesville as a businessman, as an entrepreneur? You know, I've, because I've sold 50 garden boxes, um, I feel like you've got to be a little bit innovative in how you're doing things and observing and adapting to what's going on. I think because we have the university, I don't know how it's going to be affected by all this long term, but. What do we know? What what the endowment of UVA is? Billions with a B, few billions. I I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Okay, um, but I mean, I think that I, I saw the other day that all the athletic coaches, head coaches, took a pay cut so that kind of they would pay cut at the top so that the bottom wouldn't bottom and middle wouldn't be quite as affected as the top. Um, but I think there's so many people that work for the university and work for the hospital system, and we've got quite a lot of federal subsidy money coming in yeah. between the university and some other things that are around here. So I don't feel like the economy is going to be hit so hard here because of the vast number of employees that are associated with those businesses. And so I think it's on the local owners to figure out how do we adapt to what's being thrown at us. Knowing that we kind of have a captive audience, we live in this small enough town that we're not getting inundated like the big cities with, you know, getting sick and, and all of that. And we have an, enough social, social isolation 
um, because we're not all piled on top of each other. Yeah. So I think we can do things differently than a lot of other bigger cities. Dude, dude, my, uh, I got a, not, it's 9.5 billion is the endowment. Okay. 9.5 billion, which is a heck of a lot of money. Uh, cool. So they're making, they're making what, a 80 million a year on interest, 70 million, 80 million a year on interest. You're smarter than I am when it comes to that. Is that how much? I mean, say, say 5%, that's 45 million. Yeah. I mean, we, we could live on that. I, I, okay. I live on that. I, I'm going to throw, okay. I'm going to throw this to you here. Um, and, and, and you're crushing it right now. Justin Goodman says, I've talked to Eric about a couple ideas and he's the guy that says, can you come to my living room right now and talk about this? <laughs> uh, uh, let, me, right. let me throw Ray Jordan. Welcome to the show. Terry Thompson, Stephanie Wells Rhodes. Hello. Jed Bowden. Hello. Um, I agree with just about everything you said here. Can you imagine my brother-in-law works for a ratings company? They rate supply chains in New York City. He, his office in Manhattan is obviously closed because it's an epicenter of nastiness. And he's now at our home um, working. And he's a fantastic guy. But can you imagine going into like on public transit in a densely populated area into an office building where everyone's out? I mean, can you just, I mean, it's crazy, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, we had somebody um, inquire on um, Airbnb to rent a, a, an entire house for a few months. Of yours? Of ours. Okay, so this yeah. is an investment. Uh, yes, okay. and, and it, it, we said no because of the logistics of it, but um, we, put, we had put like $20,000 a month on just because of the nightly rate and yada, yada, yada. And they're like, we can't do that much, but we'd be happy to do eight, eight or ten thousand dollars. And a you month. said yes, right? <laughs> we did not say Why yes not? because of the logistics <laughs> that it would require to move from this space that we are inhabiting. Um, and just because we ha we have such a, a great setup right now, and it was just going to be too much to do that. But the fact of the matter is that you can get a two bedroom apartment in New York for six thousand dollars. Do you know how much you can afford here for six thousand yeah, dollars a month? Nuts. Like, right. mind blown. Yeah. And so I wonder if you know all this Zoom and all these calls like we're doing are going to change how people interact and how people travel. Yes. For work. Yes. The, they're gonna be like, I don't have to go there anymore because we got this stuff figured out, and I got a home office thing. And Dude, I think what's gonna I, you're 100 percent right, and I, what I think is gonna happen is is I think people are gonna be, and I want to talk about this on the show, and I want to talk about it with Matthew Gillikin, and Matthew Gillikin yeah. is a huge proponent of public transportation and creating as much density as possible in cities, in cities, and then creating this like working, um, walking, live, work, play environment where people rely less on transportation. I think what's going to happen with COVID-19, it could be the opposite for human behavior where we want to get away from densely populated uh, areas, even like a city like Charlottesville. It's going to create a push to suburbia where we can get a little bit bigger plot of land, build a little bit bigger home. We're probably going to have an emphasis on home studios where if we choose to work from home, we have this backup option where we can go into this home studio and work and do video conferencing like this. And then people are also going to put more of an emphasis of chilling with their family and their kids in a neighborhood or yeah. backyard type of setting as opposed to a dense urban thoughts anywhere you want to go no i think that i think you're totally right i think that homes are where we're at right now and we're getting really accustomed to being home and making our work work alongside of our right. family um, and trying to figure out the best way to continue working and bringing in an income and yeah i think having home studios is going to really take off and in, you know, I've had a few conversations with people about why aren't we seeing more like prefabbed house studio like kits out there everywhere like, being sold. yeah right um, maybe they're out there I'm just not seeing them all my all my um, sponsored posts coming on my Instagram are about gardens not about um, tiny tiny homes but that also sorry that also does play into the auxiliary dwelling units that Keith Smith, Keith Smith and, watching Keith Smith watching are, yeah. are talking about. And so what if, what if in our backyards, rather than just having a studio, we have a carriage house that we have our own studio and then we rent an apartment. So that kind of also gets to Matthew Gillikin's thing where we want to be a little bit more densely populated. You can still have the studio out in the back and you can also have a renter that's living there. Or 
I don't know, but I think I think we're gonna probably move away from this like bus type transit oh, yeah. system and and into having something else. But you know, we've stripped down to only what we need to purchase right now and only going out when we need to go out. I have a truck that I'm borrowing from a friend and I'm like, oh, this gas that I'm using is cheap, but I'm still using a lot of gas. I don't really have an, op a, a, an alternative option right now. It's okay because it's, the gas is so cheap, but like we just, we don't go out as much as we had to. And, um, so it's all crazy and we're, we're trying uh, to figure what's it the out. Dude, I, so much questions coming in here, and you get me thinking on so many things here. How about this question for you? And Andre Xavier, I'm going to get to your question. Tim and Crozet, I'm going to get to your question. How about this? Last month, April, the best month in decades for NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, Wall Street's crushing it, okay? The best month in decades for Wall Street last month. At the same time, 30-plus million Americans are out of work. And 500,000 Virginians are out of work. It's nuts, the disparity between the haves and have-nots right now. I have not right now. What do you mean? I'm on Medicaid. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like, there is definitely a disparity between the haves and have-nots. I, you know, up until a month, six weeks ago, I would have said, yeah, I have, I have. I'm, like, doing pretty well. We had our biggest year for Eric Kelly photography ever last year and then <laughs> cut. And I don't, I don't say like I am in, in the have not category and you're like, well, you, you made $13,000 off these boxes. Well, yeah, what's my cost? Right, and right, how long right, is it right. taken? And, you know, all of that stuff. And so, um, I just, I, I think that NASDAQ, you know, it was so high. How many people, how many of those big people that know about things shorted all these companies when they're at all time Probably highs? Not. How many CEOs left positions in January? 320, something like that, is a huge number. So the people at the top saw what was coming, shorted the market, you know, whatever. Yeah, 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 you're right. Politicians do this. Oh, we have politicians on record that have done this. You're exactly right. So they, 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 buy, they have all these stocks. They see this epidemic coming way more seriously than government officials yeah. saw it. They, sh they short these companies. They wait for everybody to panic sell and get everything done. Meanwhile, then they turn around and they buy it. So what happens when you buy they back got, the They got two for one. Or sell it, whatever you have to do at the bottom, and then they make yeah. all this money back. He's exactly right. So, Andre says Airbnb demand. Huge drop are you expecting in 2020? Dude, I, can I say this? And I'm not trying to be a negative Nancy here. My, my wife, she's watching right now. She's a phenomenal woman. She probably is going to be much more inclined for the family when we travel to go to like a hotel where like there's an in-house professional cleaning crew versus Airbnb. That's just us. Andre wants to know about Airbnb. What you're, I think he's got some investments too. What are you thinking for it? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're probably going to be looking at smaller groups. I mean, the city wanted that anyway. They didn't want to have more than 12 people in a place. So um, you know, we got an inquiry the other day for two people uh, coming this weekend. I don't know if they're going to book or not, but two people wanted to, I mean, do they have other places to go right now? I'm not sure. I think hotels are going to have, um, you know, sterilization things, hospital grade sanitation. I don't know what they're called. Um, fog machines well, to clear yeah. everything out. But, you know, I would say that families are going to be more hesitant to book out their uh, their homes that they're living in um to strange people every oh, you're, oh so you're taking a different look you're saying it's not that the demand's not going to be there it's that the supply's not going to be there for fear of booking out your home and sick people coming in you're saying it's just going to be a supply issue interesting I don't know what I'm saying other than what I well, said. I respect that. <laughs> I mean, that would, I guess, yeah, that would make a supply, I mean, a supply and demand issue. Um, I think there will be people on both sides that are like, I don't want to go there. I want to go to a hotel because they're going to be able to clean it better. Um, but, I mean, for us, having a 60-something-year-old a, a mother-in-law who has rented her house on Airbnb, we're like, do we want these 20-something, 30-something bachelorettes coming into our house for the weekend and having a good time. And then what do we need to do on the backside of that 
stay to make it so that we can stay here again. She can stay here again. So that there's hesitation on our end in terms of that. I read a story the other day about a woman that um, was totally leveraged on Airbnb mortgages and she's got no income. So she's going to default on all these things. And so I think that the, the, Big You're basically saying of, you read a story where the lady had a, a bunch of properties, all the properties, the overheads being paid by Airbnb rentals, Airbnb stopped, and she's expecting a collapse of her flimsy house of cards. Jeebus, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that one. Uh, yeah. That's going to happen. That's I mean, serious. That, I, thought of, I had thought about that. We didn't do it. We didn't yeah. act on that. But I'm like, oh, let's go get another one. We got this and we got this. And how do we, how do we just take advantage of this? Rolling. Yeah. It was rolling. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, dude. I hadn't thought about that. That's yeah. going to happen. Um, you crushed it, dude. Um, anywhere you want to go. How about a final word? Anywhere you want to go for Charlottesville. Um, get out and garden. Um, go, buy our, go buy the book on Amazon okay. today, um, and you'll get a, you'll get a year-long growing Ooh. guide. But if you got you got to buy it okay. today. So um, it's called The Kitchen Garden Revival. Okay. It's on Amazon. It's like 30 bucks. And it'll help you uh, learn how to garden. It's not hard. You start with herbs and lettuces and um, kale and this, the easiest things to grow. And we, we, I, I planted one packet of seeds last yeah. fall. And we've had salad from that one packet of seeds every day for the last month wow. and a half. And it's still more than we My can wife's handle. watching right now and is getting excited for a garden. We've and then buy a garden box. There we go. That's my boy. Always be closing. ABC right there, Eric Kelly. There you go. You're the man. I appreciate you. Yeah, Thanks, you have a good sir. one. Bye. You too. See Take ya. care. Eric Kelly, guys. Good guy. Always be closing. I love it right there. Um, I appreciate it. It's yeah, see, she's watching. She says truth. Um, Camelin Leon. Am I watching it, Camelin? Am I saying your last name right, Leon? I'll check out the book. I'm glad I tuned in. Hooray for Victory Gardens. Um, people saying they want it. They're going out and gardening more than ever now as a hobby to get out of the, the, the uh, house. Thank you for that interview with Eric. That's from Grace. Live on 12 Facebook pages. I want to close on a couple things. The, the, and Eric, you crushed it. You, you're amazing. You're great. Um, message from Jim Ryan Judah, president of UVA, in four minutes, five minutes. I want everyone that's watching the program to tag a restaurant owner. Right now, if you're watching the show, tag the name of a restaurant owner in the feed of any of the 12 Facebook pages you're watching this show on it now. We're going to come up with a strategy of how to save restaurants, small strategy, for a certain area in Charlottesville, Virginia. Here's what I think we got to do. And I'm going to outline it clearly on ilovesevil.com. We have to create a beer garden from the pavilion to the Omni. And from the pavilion to the Omni, you can patronize the restaurants downtown and enjoy an alcoholic beverage while walking from the pavilion to the Omni in a beer garden type setting. Before you can enjoy that beverage, you go to a hut that is, com that is um, personneled or staffed by the city of Charlottesville. That hut is located in the center of the downtown mall. There used to be a hut or a little, little like uh, cabana there in the past that the city ran. That hut's on the center of the mall. It's almost like this check-in point. At the check-in point, you pay a couple of bucks, and for a couple of bucks, you get, what is the word I'm looking for? Not a bracelet. It's like those paper things they put on your wrist, and you stick to them. Judah, you know the word I'm talking about? I'm drawing a blank on this. All right, let's take two. You get a paper bracelet. I'm drawing a blank on it that they stick on your wrist. You pay them two bucks. The city of Charlottesville keeps the two dollars from the bracelet after they check your ID. The city of Charlottesville also gives you a cheap plastic cup and says, this is the plastic cup that you have to use to be able to walk from restaurant to restaurant while consuming this beverage. You then take the cheap plastic cup to a downtown mall restaurant and you have it filled up at whatever price they want to charge you. That's the market creating the price point. At whatever price they want to charge you, you get the cup filled and you can walk around. And you don't have to be stressed about being too close to people. And ah, 
ah, people coughing on you, or a dining room being too small. This is going to create this economic impact. It's going to get Charlottesvillians coming to downtown Charlottesville, the heartbeat of Charlottesville. It's going to give money to the city up front and money on the back end to the city from a meal stack standpoint. It's going to stimulate restaurants and retail in the downtown mall because people are going to be having beverages while walking up and down the mall outside for fear of COVID-19 as opposed to dining rooms. They'll encourage people to hang around the mall and shop. The revenue then could be allocated to firemen, schools, streets, infrastructure, whatever the heck the city needs. It's time for Lloyd Snook and Heather Hill and Cedar McGill and Mayor Walker and, Pi and Michael Payne to think outside the box. Here's a good idea to simulate the economy in downtown Charlottesville. Restaurant owners that are watching this program, you're probably going to have to sacrifice the crossing on 4th Street, and I know that pains you. But you're not going to be able to have this beer garden from the Omni to the Pavilion without closing the 4th Street crossing because you can't have cars going across a beer garden. You close 4th Street, you got this four or five block corridor, and you get people coming back to Charlottesville. And they're doing it in a safe six foot social distancing setting. Tag, tag the city councilors in the feed. Tag the restaurant owners in the feed. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Jude, I wanna get to Jim Ryan, president of the University of Virginia. Let me know when you have it uh, ready to rock and roll. This is an important message that you need to hear. It's from President Jim Ryan. Give me that thumbs up. Jim Ryan, I'm going to say this before we get to the video, and I'll give you the straight three, two, one countdown. I'm going to straight up make this call. The president of the University of Virginia, Jim Ryan, of anyone else in Charlottesville, Virginia, Jim Ryan has more influence, say, and direction of where Charlottesville is going to go. City councilors don't have much power. City manager is managing a budget, and it's controlled by the city councilors and bureaucracy. Okay? Jim Ryan's a guy that is, lack of better phrase, has the most pressure on his shoulders for the future of Charlottesville because of this machine that he runs and he commands and he's the CEO of. Here's a message from him. Judy, are you ready? Three, two, one. Hi everyone, I hope this message finds all of you, your families and your friends safe and well. We just finished classes this week and I'd like to mark the occasion by taking a moment to thank all of you, our faculty, staff, students and alumni. This has been an extraordinary semester in every sense of the term. It has in many ways been extraordinarily challenging. While the number of COVID-19 cases in our community hasn't risen as dramatically as we had feared, we now have two dozen patients being treated in our health system. Members of our community have been infected, and some of our alumni have died from the disease. The economic impact of this pandemic has meant that we've had to make difficult decisions across the university, especially within the health system, which has been hurt financially because it's been so well prepared medically for COVID-19 patients. At the same time, many of our employees have had to juggle work and family, faculty have had to adjust their courses and course plans to teach online, and our students have had to adjust to being both at home and online. All that said, in extraordinary times, extraordinary institutions do extraordinary things. And this 200-year-old institution is extraordinary. It survived the Civil War, two world wars, and the Korean and Vietnam Wars. It survived 9-11 and the 1918 flu pandemic. In fact, UVA didn't just survive these crises and others. It's managed to thrive over time. And so it is and will be with this pandemic, which poses a challenge unlike any other we've seen in our lifetime. We have risen to meet this challenge, which is to say that you, our students, faculty, staff, and alumni have risen to meet it. You face this challenge with extraordinary dedication, creativity, and compassion. To cite just a few examples from literally hundreds, members of the library staff scanned and delivered more than 64,000 pages of content to students and faculty. Teams from the architecture and engineering schools worked together to create a new way to make face shields for doctors and nurses treating COVID-19 patients. Faculty not only taught their classes in new and challenging ways, but continued to mentor and advise students, including a faculty member from the college who has spent two hours a day for the last couple of weeks helping a student fine-tune her thesis over video chat. 
something I learned from a letter sent to me by a grateful parent. A team of UVA employees and volunteers has provided aid to hundreds of furloughed contract workers and a group from the law school volunteered to help them apply for unemployment benefits. A team of UVA faculty, lab professionals, and staff created the first local test in Virginia for COVID-19, and they can now test hundreds of people a day, not just those from UVA and Charlottesville, but across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Two health system employees traveled to Tennessee to bring back a robot that's now being used to sanitize up to 6,000 N95 masks per day so that they can be reused. You've also supported each other all along the way, making it abundantly clear just how strong and connected this community is at its best. A group of students created Who's Helping Who's, a network that connects students who need assistance with members of the community who can offer it. And staff from Student Financial Services and Student Affairs have worked together to distribute nearly a million dollars in assistance to students in need. Construction crews working on the new UVA Health Wing lined up at 6.30 a.m. to cheer healthcare workers on their way to work or leaving their shifts. A group of alumni and parents in China came together to donate and ship 20,000 surgical face masks to the health system. Members of the University Guide Service and Black Student Alliance have reached out to admitted students to tell them all about UVA. Finally, talented singers, dancers, musicians, and artists in our community have helped lift our spirits as part of our Digital Arts on the Hill program. For all of this and more, you have my profound thanks, and the thanks of my colleagues Liz McGill, our provost, J.J. Davis, our COO, and Craig Kent, our EVP for Health Affairs. The semester isn't entirely over as papers and exams and grading still await, but thank you and congratulations on making it this far. It hasn't been easy, it hasn't been perfect, and our work is not complete. But it's nonetheless been inspiring to be a part of this community as it continued its inevitably imperfect pursuit of high ideals even during a uniquely challenging time. As we look ahead, I know that many, if not all of you, are eager to know what the fall will look like. I am as well. We will certainly be open and offering courses, that much is clear. Our hope is that we will have students back on grounds and that we'll be teaching our courses in person. We're working night and day to figure out how we might do that safely. We're also making contingency plans in case not all students can be here in person and in case some courses will need to be online. This is a complicated task, but we have a remarkable group of faculty, staff, and students working on it. We'll keep you posted on our progress and expect to announce our plans for the fall in mid-June. We already know that next fall will call on us to summon once again the flexibility, creativity, and resilience that carried us through this semester. Runners tend to overuse marathon analogies, so I apologize in advance for ending this message with yet another, but I can't resist. If you've ever run a marathon, you know that it's at about mile 11 or so that you start to realize that marathons are long and they are hard but you tell yourself repeatedly that there is a finish line and that you will get there even if you can't see it yet. You just have to keep running one step at a time and you have to remind yourself that you're not in this alone. You know you'll get support and encouragement from your fellow runners and spectators. We're at mile 11 in this pandemic. There's still a long road in front of us and at times it will be hard, but there is a finish line ahead even if we can't see it yet. We will cross that line together, supporting each other the whole way. And when we do cross that line, we'll likely be a little tired and sore and maybe even a bit bruised. But we'll be better and stronger for the experience and we'll share a bond that won't soon be broken. Thank you and be well. Hi, everyone. That's Jim Ryan right there, um, president of the University of Virginia and a man that has a job that I do not want to pretend like I understand what it's like for a day to day. There's no one in Charlottesville in Central Virginia that has more influence in to what's gonna happen in Charlottesville than Jim Ryan. And I respect his um, willingness to connect with the public through that message. He comes across as an approachable, likable, kind, and very human and in touch type of guy. And I like that. I think now we're really gonna see, to use his analogy, what, if we truly are at marker 11 in a marathon, what the next 15 is gonna look like. It's gonna to be tough. We'll get through it together. 
It's the I Love Seville show. Take care.